Good morning. Welcome you as we gather together as the children of God to worship. Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, for he is to be feared above all gods. Let's sing and worship him and declare his glory this morning. Great to see you today. Thank you, music team, for, for leading us. If you wonder why Mackie's sitting over there, hold up what you got there, buddy. 
he's controlling the sound a little bit and, and kind of we, what we've done is we've installed uh, as part of you know the ongoing uh, strategic planning and renovation we've, we've put in a lot of new sound equipment so what Mackie's done is the last week and this week he's sort of listening out there and fidgeting with it and doing the things he knows how to do so he hasn't quit if anybody was wondering He's working and doing the things he needs to do. So we appreciate that so much. If you're our guest today, thank you for being here. I, I see some new faces and it's wonderful to see you. And some we have met, some we haven't. I hope that we will. If you would like to do us a favor, if you would like, there's a little tear off on your bulletin that you got. And on it, you can leave us your contact information. You can tell us how you'd prefer to be, be contacted. There's things on the back of it. Uh, that you can check things that you're interested in to let us know. Also, uh, members know you can use this anytime as well to update information or put in a prayer request. Hand that to me, put it in one of the offering plates that you see by the doors. We'd love uh, to receive that from you today. So, so glad that you guys are here in worship today. We're going to be talking today about what it means when Jesus said to, to strive to salvation. It's kind of language that we're not used to in our Protestant and our Baptist culture. We talk a lot about grace and about grace alone and faith alone. But Jesus talked about striving for salvation. And we really do need to understand what that means today. So will you pray with me and we'll continue in our worship. Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and thanks for the grace we've received in the Son of God, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. We declare today the truth of your word that tells us that there is no other name than the name of Jesus through which all people can be saved. Today we offer you our praise because of this great salvation that you have made available to all who truly repent and sin and put their faith in you alone. Remind us today of the importance of the truth of Jesus' words who commanded us to strive after this salvation. Help us to understand with clarity and certainty what this means. Lead us in your truth. Let each person know in his or her heart with spiritual accuracy. Know ourselves. Let no person today continue with a deceptive spirit that would maintain a false assurance and a denial of your truth. God, we humbly seek to know your truth alone because we know you have the words of life. So make our minds keen to your truth and our hearts receptive to your word. Make us humble before you. May the Spirit bring conviction to hearts about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. May our spirits truly hunger and thirst for your truth and righteousness. Bend our wills under the weight of your love and your mercy so that we will submit fully to you with joy and glorify you with our lives. Father, let all that we do here today in your house be pleasing to you. We ask all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope that you'll continue to remember in prayer our young people. Uh, they've been at Ridgecrest this week. They'll actually be headed back this afternoon and be with us this evening. So I'll be reading scripture today. Uh, our scripture readings come from James. And from Romans. So in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, James writes, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. And then in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 13. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that a person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, 
that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Would you stand as we continue to worship him?
and take your Bible and find Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 13, and we're going to continue there through the Gospel of Luke beginning in verse 22. Now, this is going to be a little bit different message because it's going to use some language that's going to sound very, very foreign to this pulpit, to this congregation, but yet we've got to interact with it because these are words that Jesus said. And we need to figure out what it means. One of the things that, the main thing that makes Christianity different than any other world religion or any other idea out there is that there's absolutely nothing you or I can do to earn our favor with God, to to try to work our way into heaven. We understand that the message of the Bible, the message of Jesus, the message from beginning to end is always one of grace. It is one of God's mercy to his fallen creation. And that only through faith and only through God's grace are we reconciled back to him, that we have salvation, this salvation we're going to talk about today. It's only that way. But yet we get to this part where Jesus is teaching in the Gospel of Luke and we hear him say the words to strive to enter through the narrow door. And we're going to talk about, well, what did Jesus mean by that? We thought we were saved by grace. What is this striving that he's talking about? And it's very, very important for us to understand this because when he says to strive, he means to make an effort, a strong effort to do something that relates to our salvation. And we need to understand what this means. So let's read the text and then you pray for me as we work our way through it. And let God show us what he has to tell us today. Verse 22, Luke chapter 13, and we'll read down through verse 30. Luke picks up in the story and he says, He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Let's pray. Father, give us wisdom to understand the teachings of our Lord here. Help our minds to receive it and our, and our hearts to embrace it by faith. Lord, strengthen us to obey your word, to heed its encouragements, and its warnings. And today, speak to us all here and remind us of the gift of salvation in Christ, but also what he teaches us here about striving toward it. And for the person or persons here today who may still not be striving in the way that Jesus talks about here, Lord, would they be compelled by your spirit and by the truth of your word to do so, to see the urgency and to understand what is at stake and to understand how much you love them. So would you take this time and you use it and you work it to advance this good news that you've given. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Just a little bit of context of, of where we are in the story. We, we see here again that, that Luke mentions that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. We first saw that in, in chapter 9 where Luke said, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face 
toward Jerusalem. So since that part in in chapter 9, and Luke reminds us here again that this was Jesus' journey. This is where he was going. Not that he hadn't been to Jerusalem before, but now something different is happening. He's setting his face there. This is about his mission and his purpose that's going to ultimately end up at the cross. This is what Jesus is doing. This is what Luke means when he says he's looking and journeying towards Jerusalem. This is his trajectory. This is his purpose. But along the way, someone in the crowd, Luke says, it's unnamed, we don't know who this person is, asks a question. And it's about the kingdom. We've seen him talking about the kingdom, but they ask a question about how many will be in that kingdom. Will it be few? In other words, is it going to be many that are there? Is it going to be few that are there? It's an interesting question because you kind of wonder where it's coming from, don't you? Like, where did this question come from? I'm always asking questions about the question. Why would somebody ask that? And the only thing I can reason and speculate on, because it doesn't tell us in the text, is that this was someone who's actually been paying attention to what Jesus has been saying. Because Jesus had been saying things that might lead to a question like this. He had been warning people about the need to repent for people to have faith. He's been telling them that he has come to bring a sword. He's come to bring division even within households and families. He's warned them about the leaven of of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And he's even challenged the religious leaders. And he's already taught about how the path to follow him, the path into the kingdom, is one that is difficult and hard. So apparently somebody's been listening to what Jesus has actually been saying and not just wowed by all the miracles. And so they ask the question, Lord, will those who are saved be saved? few because what I'm hearing is kind of like you're kind of saying that and Jesus doesn't answer the question directly you've kind of gotten used to that with Jesus he never hardly answers a question directly but he takes the opportunity to teach something that is very profound and something that's very important which does ultimately answer the question but he usually gives us more than what we ask for and that's a good thing because we need to understand these things. So he, he says this, instead of answering the question, well, yes, there'll be few or no, there's going to be many. He just gives a command. And he says to that person, strive, strive. It's a command. It's an imperative. Strive to enter through the narrow door. That's his answer to the question. And that's what we have to kind of flesh out. What does Jesus mean by this and why is he giving this command and and what are the implications and all that he says that follows that. So I want us to to work our way through this and make sure we really understand what Jesus is saying here because we don't want to misunderstand what he's saying, but we really do need to appreciate what he is saying about striving to salvation. There is something involved in that. So what he does, let's, let's go to the first point. The first point is this, and we'll just work through four points that I believe are in this text. The first one is this, the way of salvation is narrow. He just says that very clean, plainly, the way of salvation is narrow. He said salvation is like attempting to get through a narrow door. The King James says a straight gate. But the idea is something that is difficult. It's an image of an entrance or a way into a place that is, that is confined and restricted in some way. It's a difficult place to navigate and, and to get into. Now, Jesus uses this image of a door in different ways in his teachings. He uses it as a reference of this narrow, difficult way that he's going to unpack here in Luke. But he also uses it as a metaphor for himself. You remember in in John, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus is also the door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is both the door himself. We know that there's no other name. He is the only one by which we are saved. He's the door. There's no other door. It's not multiple choice. But he's also using this image of a door or a gate in a way of saying that this way to him, this process of salvation and coming to him is a way that's not exactly easy. 
It's narrow. And it's this is the emphasis of the text we're looking at today, that it's difficult. And it's not because that salvation is, is difficult to understand. The gospel is not a difficult message to understand. That because men and women, boys and girls, are sinful, God's plan for salvation was that the Son of God would come, live a perfect life, die on the cross as a substitute for your sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead so that we would all know that everything he said, everything he did, everything he claimed was absolutely true. There was the proof in his resurrection. And the message has always been for those who would repent of sin and put their trust in Christ to be their substitute, that God would save them by his grace through that faith. That's not hard to understand, is it? Children can understand the gospel. It's not that the gospel is hard to understand, but what Jesus is saying, it's hard to achieve. He said it's a hard thing for people to find and to possess. Not that they can't understand it with their minds, but there are certain barriers that really make it hard to get to. It's like this. Imagine, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to a military base, many of you have, maybe in serving or in visiting, but there's usually, there's a gate at any military base. And at a gate, at any military base, there are barriers. Sometimes they make you do this, in and out, to slow you down. There, there, are, there are guards there, security forces or military police, and they have guns. And if they're on high alert, that for some reason, they may stop you. They may search your car. In other words, you don't just casually walk up or drive up to a military base gate and just go on through. Because if you try to do that, and I'm not suggesting you try, you'll find your face on the pavement or you might be shot. So don't do that. It, it's, it's like that. It's a, it's a, it's a gateway. It's a door. It's a place of entrance, but you don't approach it flippantly or casually. It's a, it's a difficult place to negotiate. Even in Jesus' day in the first century, there were fortresses, there were cities that had the same kind of principle. There were gates, there were narrow doors that you could go through, but not narrow in the sense that they simply were narrow and not wide, but difficult to get through. You just didn't walk up to them in any old casual way and get through. There's a certain striving that had to take place for you to get through. And here's what Jesus said. He said, strive to enter through this narrow gate. There's some striving that's going to take place. And he said, many will seek to enter, but they will not be able. Isn't that interesting? Many will seek to enter, but they will not be able. So the question is, why? And the reason is because they will seek, but they will not strive. That's why. They will look toward it, but they won't strive for it. And that's Jesus' point. He said you have to strive to come in through this gate. So we need to understand what strive means. Now, that word strive there that Jesus uses in that context, in that world, it was a Greek word, agonizomai. Agonizomai. Does that sound familiar? We get the word agony from it. It, it means to exert a, a strong and strenuous effort. And Jesus is saying, as he uses this metaphor of a narrow door for salvation, he says in some way there is this strong, agonizing, serious, strenuous effort that people must make in order to achieve salvation. And many will look at it, many will seek it, but many won't be able to enter. Why? Because they won't do that. So again, what does that mean? Well, I found one reference that was helpful to me from a, a former Baptist from a long time ago, an English Baptist by the name of John Gill, lived in the 18th century. But here's what he said about this command from Jesus. He said, to strive is to be diligent in the use of means, to search the scriptures with care, to attend on the preaching of the word with constancy, neglecting no opportunity to pray earnestly for spiritual light, knowledge, and grace, to contend with every enemy that opposes the salvation of the soul as sin, Satan, and the world, 
to bear all reproaches and persecutions and press through all difficulties for the prize of that incorruptible crown. Did you hear what he said? What Jesus is saying to that crowd and what God's word continues to teach us today is that there's going to be opportunity. There's going to be message. There's going to be things put before people that will give them the hope of life and salvation. But you can't just casually make your way through it. There is a sense of striving that you put forward in order to seek God, in order to be hungry for what God really wants to give you. You don't just haphazardly become a Christian. It's not just a club you just sort of sign up for. It's not merely a tradition you're born into. It's not just a, a place you go to to hang out for an hour or two on a Sunday morning. It's, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. It's not just about being on, on a church roll and, and being in a church. It's something that you earnestly come after. God says it in different ways in the scripture. It says you have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You have to hunger and thirst. You know what it's like to be hungry, don't you? Hungry for something, something that you deeply have within you that you want satisfied. And so you, you search for that satisfaction. You desire it. Jesus talked about counting the cost. He talked about denying yourself, picking up your cross and following him. You have to abandon a, a self-driven life and you surrender to the lordship of Christ. You can't just hear the word. James says you have to do the word. These are all the different ways and so many more that the Bible explains what Jesus is talking about here, that there is a striving after salvation, a striving to salvation. It's not a casual thing. The Bible knows nothing, nothing of a casual, cost you nothing, low commitment Christianity. The Bible doesn't know that. The Bible only knows and Jesus only preached and the apostles only communicated this message that to be a Christian is an all-in proposition. There's nothing casual about it. You give your life and you strive after the truth and you strive after Jesus. This is where God meets you in salvation. The way is narrow, which means it's difficult. It's not easy. And not everybody's willing to do it. That's what Jesus is saying. Second thing that we learn here, in addition to the, the way being narrow and difficult and we have to strive, is number two, the opportunity for salvation is limited. The opportunity is limited. You notice he said the narrow door that he says we must strive to go through becomes a shut door. It becomes a shut door after some time which means that what was once merely difficult and something to strive for, now it has become impossible because the door is shut. And it's very clear who shut the door. It talks about the master or the owner of the house shuts the door at some point. And because of the context, we know that the master is Jesus. Because the people are saying, hey, didn't we hang out with you and eat with you and hear you teach? And it doesn't matter. Because he is determined now is the time where the door is going to be shut. And there's an important principle here for everyone who's listening to me today, especially, you know, if you don't know Christ, if you're not truly in him, you need to understand that there is a limitation. There's a window of opportunity. And Jesus is saying you need to strive while you've been given time because at some point the master's going to shut the door. And you saw what happened when the door was shut. The opportunity was gone. Occasionally, uh, Cindy graciously gives me some coupons. And uh, I, don't know she get, I don't know where she gets them, little leaflets, newspapers. That she, every once in a while, she'll hand me a stack of coupons and say, here you go, you might want to use these. And they're, you know, they're for Burger King or McDonald's or Bojang, you know, whatever. Get, get a chicken sandwich or, you know, save a little, save a little money. And she'll hand those to me, and I'll put them in my car, or I'll put them in my bag, or lay them on my desk, or stick them in the drawer. And you know what happens. You know what happens. 
because it happens to you too. Inevitably, when I remember, oh, I got a coupon for that, and I'm getting kind of hungry, it's lunchtime, and I go and get it, it expired two days earlier. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Well, Jesus is saying there's an expiration on your opportunity to come to salvation. And, you know, a coupon that's just going to save you 50 cents on a chicken sandwich is one thing. But to have your opportunity expire for something that is truly most important, the destiny of your eternal soul, is another thing. And Jesus is saying, listen, while you have time to strive, you need to strive because someday the door that is just merely difficult is going to be shut. And your opportunity will be gone. One of the things that we do often is we just presume on more time. We all do it. Every one of us do it. We just presume that there'll always be more time. And we procrastinate. I don't know if you're a procrastinator. We probably all are to some degree about jobs or things or things we need to do in our list at home or whatever it may be. But there are people every day. There are people probably in this room, in churches everywhere this morning, thinking, I got more time and I'm not ready to do this yet. And can I tell you, I, I get that. I think we're all wired that way a little bit. But can I tell you that it's so presumptuous and arrogant because God tells you, you don't know. You have no idea when your days are numbered, when they are up, and when this door is going to be shut. That's why Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, he quoted the prophet Isaiah and he talked about his ministry and others' ministry to them. And listen to what he said to them. First, Second Corinthians chapter 6, he said, working together with him, he's talking about Christ, working with Christ, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't just hear about this. For he says, and here is where he quotes from Isaiah, in a profitable time, I listened to you. And then Paul says, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul was telling those believers then, don't think you have more time. God has told you now. You've heard the gospel. You know the good news. It's not that complicated. Now is the time for you to respond to it because one day the door is going to shut. That takes us to the third point. And the third point is this. The exclusion from salvation is irreversible. And you need to understand that as well. Once the door is shut, it's not opening again. And this is a truth that you must understand if you're not in Christ. The scene that Jesus gives in this little parable, this illustration, is that the door is shut, the master has shut the door, and then the people come and they start banging on the door because they want in. They've been excluded. And they start banging on the door, and the answer from within is a flat no. No, I'm not opening the door. You had your chance, and you refused. And then you, you, you heard them say, well, we ate, and we drank in your presence, and, and, and you taught in our streets. In other words, Jesus, you know, we hung out with you. Don't you know us? Now, in the context of, of what's happening here, Jesus is really instructing the Jews who in his ministry he was literally hanging out with and teaching them all the time and eating with them and drinking with them. So it has a, a very literal connection to that time when Jesus was living and in his ministry, but the application is, is universal. Because in a sense, you're here today hanging out with Jesus. You're hearing the truth of his word. You're in a house of worship where the gospel is being proclaimed and, and you're being told that you have to repent of your sin and you need to believe in Christ to have salvation and you need to strive after that. But when the door is shut and you come knocking later, the answer to you will also be no. And he said this. He said to those people knocking on the door, desperately wanting in, depart from me, all you workers of evil. All you workers of evil. And here's what you've got to remember, that just because you've been exposed to the truth doesn't mean that you're in the truth. There are people being exposed to the truth 
week after week after week in this country, in this town, in this church. Week after week, they're being exposed to the truth, but it doesn't mean they're in it. And when the door is shut, and when it's locked, when it's fastened, they may find themselves on the outside wondering what in the world is going on. I thought we knew that truth. And you did know it. You understood it. You heard it. You understood it in your mind, but it wasn't yours. That's the point. People hang out in the right places. People go to church. People listen to God talk. They can even speak it themselves. They, they can be in a Christian culture all their lives, but still not truly be Christian themselves. This is one of the sobering truths that God teaches us, that Jesus kept pointing out to his own people, the Jewish, ethnic Jewish people all the time. You had the law. You've had the prophets. The Messiah has now come to you. It's not that you haven't been exposed to the truth. You're just not receiving it. And there's a, in a world of difference. And the truth is even ongoing today. There are people in churches who hear the truth, but it has not taken effect in their hearts. And someday they may be surprised, just like in this story that Jesus told. Hey, Jesus, we, I mean, we were in your house. I knew your story. I knew other Christians. And I was a good person. And Jesus is going to call them evil. One of the most sobering texts that's very much like this is in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, very much echoes what Jesus is saying here. Listen to what Jesus said there. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Listen to what he says. On that day, that day, when the door is shut, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And they'll declare to them, he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So there Jesus called them workers of lawlessness. Here in Luke, he calls them workers of, of evil. And these people certainly wouldn't see themselves that way. They would certainly justify themselves and say, but God, we, we did all these good things. You know, I, I did all these wonderful things at my church and, and helped people and did all these things. And doesn't that, that count for, for anything? But what they didn't do is they didn't strive for salvation. They didn't do what they needed to do to know God in a saving way through genuine repentance and faith, evidenced in a real spiritual fruit in their life. They didn't do any of that. They just did busy work that they thought was for the Lord their whole life. And it didn't amount to anything. Why does Jesus call them evil? Why does he call them workers of lawlessness? Listen, because at the heart of what is truly evil to God is always an unbelieving heart. Everything else flows from that. The greatest sin is not the things you and I tend to think about, the actions, and they certainly are sin. But the greatest sin against God is to not believe him to not submit to him. And everything else comes from that. And you might convince yourself, well, I'm still a good person. Well, because of God's common grace, you're not running around being as evil as you probably could be. Some people do. But maybe that's not you. But he still calls you evil, lawless, if you're outside of genuine faith, if you've never truly repented, if you've never truly trusted Christ in your life, is not bearing that evidence. He calls you evil and the door will be shut and the door will be shut forever. Please hear me. Please hear what God is saying today. There's no second chances. We love do-overs, don't we? Remember when you're a kid playing games, you know, you know do-over. I don't play much golf you ever played with me, you know why? Um, you know, you go to these tournaments and they say, you know, you, you can add a little more money to your fee and buy mulligans. I, I think there's a limit on there because of me. You know, I, I would need them every time, these do-overs, these, yeah, but, but God says there, there isn't any. When the door's shut, it shuts permanently, it shuts 
forever. So please, if you have ears to hear and you're not in Christ, hear what God is saying. He's giving you the warning. And then lastly, the fourth thing I'd point out is what comes at the very end of what Jesus says. And that is the scope of salvation is wide. The way is narrow. It's difficult. Jesus says you've got to strive for it. You've got to hunger for it. You've got to deny self. You have to come after him. You've got to pick up your cross. All the different ways that Jesus describes striving after him for genuine salvation. But the scope of it, who's going to be saved, is wide. You notice what he said there at the end, those last two verses. He, he, he's highlighting the Jew and Gentile distinction that runs throughout the New Testament. If you go on and read the next book, book of Acts, that Luke wrote, that becomes very evident as the gospel goes out to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. You read the book of Romans, and it's all about how God has brought in the Jews, and God is no respecter of persons. This, this good news of salvation has become available to everybody. There's no privileged position or, or group. And you notice he mentions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there was this understanding among ethnic Jews during Jesus' ministry because they were ethnic Jews, because of who they were, because of their position ethnically, that they were just sort of automatically in. You know, whenever the kingdom comes in, it's theirs. Just kind of assume that. But Jesus said, no. Some of you, many of you, will not be able to come in. But there are going to be those who come from every direction, north, south, east, west, who will recline at the table of the kingdom of God. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about us. He's talking about how there is no respecter of persons when it comes to God's grace and his mercy and salvation. Anyone who's willing to strive for salvation, anyone who's willing to hunger and thirst for Christ and go after him with all sincerity and truth, God says, you can come matter who you are you can come the kingdom is open to you the scope is wide even though the way is difficult in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 Paul wrote this as he was talking about salvation it's such a beautiful verse he says there is neither Jew nor Greek that'd be their ethnic divisions of the time there is neither slave nor free that would be their socioeconomic divisions there is neither male nor female gender divisions, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's saying those are the areas, ethnicities, socioeconomic ranks, even men versus women. He said these are the categories that human beings have created to elevate some and put others down. And God says none of that applies to a relationship with him. All of those distinctions are gone in those who are in Jesus Christ because the scope of salvation is, is wide. It's open to anyone, and that is good news. That's really good news because it doesn't matter if you're black or white, male or female, poor, rich, what other, other distinction that you could possibly make, those things are irrelevant to being saved. It doesn't matter if you grew up sort of squeaky clean in a Christian home or you just had this horribly sordid past that you just can't seem to get over. There's no distinctions. God's grace extends to, to all. There's nobody that is too much of anything, including too broken, for God's grace not to reach them. You understand what he's saying? He was telling these Jews, you've got to broaden your mind to understand the reach of God's grace. But at the same time, individually, you need to understand how you need to be earnest in coming after me. Not just filling up your head, but striving with your heart. So everyone has equal access to salvation, but everyone must come the same way. The same way. There's not multiple ways, but it's open to everyone. So let me ask you some questions before we sing again and we have a time of response. Let me ask you some questions. Have you done this? Have you striven after salvation? Have you done that? Because what I find many times, people, 
can't think of doing that. They've just sort of casually moved into it without a whole lot of thought, maybe because that's just how they grew up. Let me ask you this. Have you gone through the process, not of trying to earn God's favor, but truly hungering for his truth and setting yourself on a journey to know it with tenacity, going after Christ and his word and trying to get a hold of it for yourself? Have you earnestly sought to understand this salvation and that you really know what God requires of you? Have you really counted the cost of what it means to follow Jesus? He said that's so important that you can't look back. You're not fit to be his disciple if you do that. Have you really surrendered your life and put aside sinful lifestyles? Listen, one of the telltale signs that you haven't striven after salvation is if right now you're living in a sinful lifestyle, whatever that means, and you hardly give it a thought. But yet you come to church and feign to worship Jesus and submit to him. But when you leave here, you're truly not. That is one of the signs that you haven't really strived to enter through the narrow door. Are you going to hear on that day when the door is shut and the time is up, are you going to hear, well done, well done, a good and faithful servant? Or are you going to hear, based on what you've heard today, depart from me, you worker of evil, I do not know you. Do you understand this is the question? Do you understand it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, this is all that matters? It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church or you didn't, this is what matters. Are you striving? Have you done that? To know with certainty, absolute assurance that you have salvation. If you have any doubt, I'm going to invite you when we're finished here, while we're singing, you come and express that to me. Find me afterwards and let's pray and let's talk about this. Will you stand with me? And I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to sing about the cross. And I'll be up here front to receive you if you want to come to say anything, make any decision, pray together, whatever it may be. And I'll be around when we're finished if you'd rather talk then. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the encouragement and the warning. So our prayer is very specific today. God, move in any person's heart that maybe has just casually been playing around with religion, but not striving after the truth and after Christ. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you save us. We don't save ourselves. We can't, and we thank you for that. But Lord, teach us what is truly repentance. Teach us what is truly faith. Teach us what is truly submission. All of the means by which you draw us and you save us. Be at this time as we continue to worship you, Lord, and you work your will in Christ's name. Amen.
thank you for being here today. Just to remind you, as soon as we dismiss here in just a second, um, we have Sunday school. So if you don't know about Sunday school, here at Aberdeen First Baptist, we love Sunday school. And there are a variety of classes, something for everybody of every age. Um, and if you don't know where to go or you, you haven't been to one yet, would you just talk to me or somebody around you? And we will definitely get you to a, a Sunday school class that we think that you'll enjoy. Just a couple of things I want to highlight about this evening, especially tonight. Uh, we are having our Awana volunteer training at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So if you already volunteered and you know who you are, just remind you of that. You say, well, wait a minute, I kind of missed that. What's Awana? It's a children's program that we're going to be launching in September. So we need volunteers for that. We're training for that, learning about that. And if you haven't already volunteered, but you say, hey, that sounds like something I'd like to learn more about, just come on. Uh, Four o'clock down in the fellowship hall, or I'm not sure exactly where we're meeting. Does it say in there? Yep, fellowship hall. I was right. And uh, so come for that. And then after that, tonight at 530, we have our quarterly business meeting and fellowship time. Uh, here at Aberdeen, we do our, our business uh, once a quarter on Sunday evenings, and tonight is a quarterly meeting, and we take care of membership issues, other big decisions we're making together, but we eat first at 5.30, and uh, from about 5.30 to 6.15, we'll start the business part about 6.15, so it's a covered dish, but if you're our guest, uh, this is something our members do, but you're welcome to come. You can come and see what we do and see how things roll here, and uh, if you'd like to check that out and just be our guest, we would love to have you there as well. Also, notice the next Discover Aberdeen First Baptist class is on August the 1st. That's during the Sunday school hour. That's for our guests or people who want to talk about church membership or anything like that that you'd like to do. It's something I lead. It's just a one session thing. Uh, we do it periodically. So that next one is going to be on August the 1st, as well as that Sunday is our next date for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And it is at both services. That was pointed out to me that we left it out. It's at 8.30 and 11 on August the 1st. So, so glad that you're here today. I often say we close the service, but never the invitation. So uh, I'll be in our welcome center uh, just for a few minutes after we dismiss. If we still haven't met, please come on back there. It's just through that door. You can't miss it. Big old sign. Love to give you a gift, talk to you for a little bit. Anything, anything you want to talk about or pray together, please come by. Our benediction today comes from the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25. So read these with me, and then we'll be dismissed. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, in the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. You're dismissed.